Hello. Uh, I am Sam Long. I'm the new director of technology and preservation at the Bay Area Video Coalition. And this is my first, first time in EMEA, so that's very exciting. Today's kind of a series of firsts. Uh, we've released uh, QC Tools 0.6 today, so that was very exciting for us. And I also get the chance to introduce Dave Rice, which is a first for me, and I'm also very excited. Uh, I will keep going. <laughs> so QC Tools is, uh, is very much the result of hard work uh, from many individuals and organizations, uh, both in this room and, and not with us today, but you know, still working probably right now as we speak to make sure that 0 0.6 actually works for you. Uh, there's been a lot of you know, previous generations of Bayback employees that have really played an integral, integral role. Uh, Mariah Yulinskis, uh, particularly, Lauren Sorensen, who I had the, the opportunity to listen to earlier, and hope to actually introduce myself properly. Uh, the Dance Heritage Coalition, who have been critical in, in supplying us with uh, various video uh, examples for testing in the early stages, and also the rest of Dave's technical team who aren't able to be here today. So I think that one of the major themes that I've found through the, this stream in particular in the last you know, several hours really speaks to what QC Tools is for us and hopefully for you. Uh, you know, the, the goal for us to be committed to a community, uh, not only committed to the community, but engaging a community that actually wants to collaborate because that is the essential key here for us to create an open source tool. And it's also our kind of determination to release often and early, as been discussed earlier uh, in the open source uh, initial panel. Do I have time to continue? No. Okay. <laughs> On that note, I'd like to introduce Dave Rice <laughs> with some music. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, so there was this panel last year about QC tools uh, when the project was about eight months into uh, development. And now, I mean, it's a two year project, so we're almost done. We uh, wrap up by January, so we got to show what we got, and then you know, really, like in, in this panel, it would be good to encourage you guys to give uh, us some feedback to help guide the remaining work to be done on this project. Uh, as Sam probably mentioned, Bayback, NEH, QC uh, Tools. These are the two main websites: the one at Bayback and the one at GitHub, where all of our uh, content is moved to. So uh, I want to kind of like. Really, uh, Big issues, uh, frustrating archivists, is that uh, we uh, have this huge dilemma that we have this content on these like plastic rectangles that we need to move into uh, shapeless digital media, um, and we got to do this in a, in a big hurry. And it would be it would be good if we knew that we were doing a good job at it as as we went, so that we could you know trust the results, save as much content as we can. Um, now the broadcast world has uh, different sets of resources, <laughs> so you know they have different sort of tools access, accessible to them. Um, so often, like we need, we, you know, we need to use different resources to make tools specifically for archivists. Uh, so QC Tools, Open Source Project, that's what it's all about. Um, shout out to Angelo Sasserdoti, uh, formerly at Bayback now. Founder of the Paloma Pi Company. Um, this this whole project uh, kind of based was based on conversations uh, that arose out of a panel that me and Skip Alzheimer and Angelo did maybe like five years ago uh, about quality control. So we showed lots of video and tried to explain like why it scares us and keeps us up at night, like these random glitches and problems we find that we have to try to understand. Um, <laughs> Angelo and I ended up writing a grant to NEH. Uh, NEH uh, politely rejected us and, and sent some feedback. Uh, we, we responded to all their feedback, made a second draft, submitted it, uh, got rejected again, and then uh, Angelo was, it was pie time, you know, preservation was all done for him. Uh, uh, Bayback, like, kind of, you know, rewrote and redesigned the approach to the project and submitted it successfully uh, the third time, which was really amazing. Um, so the project is, as you guys have heard about GitHub, it's all moved into GitHub now. Uh, we don't have anything to hide, everything just like the good and bad gets thrown into there, and then occasionally at 
moments when we, uh, our confidence level is uh, slightly higher than usual, we'll release, uh, make a, a major release like we did this morning, um, which was uh, 0 0.06. So this is the contribution team that's actually contributed in code so far. Uh, so me, I'm D. Rice in the upper right. Uh, Jerome Martinez is a pretty crucial developer in the project. He, um, he is most known for being the principal author and developer of Media Info. Uh, Devin Landes, who presented to me last year, sort of coordinates a lot of the documentation efforts. Uh, ben Turkus at Bayback started pushing in some documentation as well. Ashley Bluer, you know, the one who just took off on me. Uh, <laughs> she did a lot of the design work, designed some really good works like for the pause and the play button and stuff. And uh, so far, Eric Peel is like the first one outside of the development team who's contributed, who sent in pull requests. Um, which are mostly based on uh, snarky conversations <laughs> for about YUV and YCBCR. Uh, outside this list, there's also uh, a big part of uh, QC Tools is a filter called Signal Stats, which was moved into FFmpeg. So there's a different set of develop developers on that side, and that's uh, Clement Bosch and Mark Heap um, in France and Australia, who are uh, who do a lot of the signal analysis to take video in and get metadata and statistics out that we can use in plot. So in addition to the coding, a big part of the project is research. So uh, this is the dark pill. We you know destroy a D5 tape, try to play it back, figure out how, how it fails. Like there are a lot of formats that we don't know how they fail in particular. In D5, we assume D5 would fail like Digibeta and give you like sparkling chroma all over the place in little uh, nice grids. But it fails by just like repeating a constant color in a in a grid shape. Um, uh, you know, here's like humanic failure. Uh, Fina, the you know the tools necessary for the job. We got cache line, uh, tape measure, and you know iPhone. Um, so in, in this time, we we, uh, we made a born digital animation combined with a uh, live action public domain uh, open access video. Recorded seven minutes on the Umatic, captured it cleanly, and then uh, destroyed the tape very methodically. <laughs> like every every 40 inches, we would do a different kind of damage, going from uh, the likely damage, like tape scratches and crinkles, to uh, you know when your tape is like ground into salt, the like, bottle, like we got that covered too. Um, and then like that's my like dental kit in the bottom, where we could use those tools for different kinds of scratches. And then Eric, this is Eric trying to get the heavily damaged tape to actually play. Um, there's one part where we had this, uh, this thing, like a very concentrated hair dryer that we would use in the film, and it like folded it in and shrank it. Uh, so in the, in the clip, you see a uh, massive loss of stabilization, a whole image shaking around as it tries to reach past that. Uh, the, the research was kind of concentrated into this feedback session at Bayback. Um, so this is, this is the crew, um, you know, the, the QC Tools crew. We all gathered in Bayback, and we spent two days, uh, you know, working over what we had, the samples we could bring together and gather. Um, this sort of focused a lot of the, the workflow and the UI and the priorities of the project. I think this happened like last uh, February or so. A bunch of this crew is, is here. I don't know. All right, and a shout out FFmpeg. Like FFmpeg is an enormous uh, building block for this project. It provides all the decoding, so we don't have to write our own like, ProRes and JPEG 2000 and uncompressed decoders. We rely on FFmpeg to decode all the video. Um, but one of the contributions that we got into FFmpeg to support the project was a, fil a, a filter called Signal Stats, which takes video in and gives metadata out. Uh, information about the YUV values, like their average, maximum, minimum, as well as uh, quantifications of certain uh, visual qualities that are not typical to see in the results of the analog video unless there is something going on. Um, for instance, like counting the amount of lines that have near identical luma as you go from one line to another. It's not common for analog video to do that because there's always some uh, noise uh, making each line distinct, but uh, like a dropout compensator and a time-based corrector can do that by just outputting the same line over and over. Uh, other issues we look for are temporal outliers, uh, which is like comparing pixels to its temporal neighbors of the previous and next frame. And if it's too distinct from its temporal neighbors, we call it we call it a temporal outlier. I mean, if it's too distinct from its neighbors, we call it a temporal outlier and tally that. Um, it usually works well to tally um, frames that have uh, skew or um, crinkles, like anything that makes like white speckle all over your your video from tape to image. Um, so in you know we weren't sure if if, uh, if this would work out or, or not, but we worked with the FFmpeg community and 
help develop the standard to, you know, they have a very rigid set of specifications and styles and uh, how they'd like it, but we were able to get it into the official FFM tag, which definitely helps with project sustainability. It also helps with uh, sort of scaling up the application of this kind of quality control because people can now just use FFmpeg directly to make all the statistics and then potentially use PC tools to view it. Generating the statistics is the more time intensive uh, part of the process because you have to decode all the video and analyze it uh, to get to get such reports. Um, you know, but potentially archives that are processing video all day can have computers like loop through all the video and process using FFmpeg to produce these reports at night. Uh, GitHub, I mean, GitHub um, QC Tools has an issue tracker that we enabled and tried to start encouraging to use. Um, so, we've got 27 issues in there so far, about half of them are closed, but you can see like what other people have identified as issues with the software, and you can contribute your, your own issues. Um, this, this includes things like bugs, if you manage to crash the application, we'd like to know how you did it. Uh, but it also includes things like wish lists and enhancement suggestions. Um, you know, to help sort of guide the remaining uh, amount of resources we have for the project. To introduce you to the UI, there's sort of three main layouts. This is sort of the most prominent one that you get to first. This is, uh, it's called like the graph layout, I think. Um, but uh, sig the signal stats filter analyzes the video, makes a value for each frame, and then plots it over time. So in this example, we're seeing uh, four different plots. We're seeing uh, a plot at the top for the, the Luma, like the Y channel, and then plots for the U and V, the two chroma channels. And then at the bottom, we're plotting uh, saturation levels. So, um, I don't know if you can see the lines too well here, but um, like with uh, saturation, for instance, you can see the saturation peaks at 181 is sort of the maximum on our scale. Um, like if you imagine looking at a vector scope from the center to the side, we call we call a distance of 128. Uh, so because of Pythagoras, uh, it's 181 point something to the corner. So that's the max. If you have a pixel in the corner of your vector scope, um, that's when you have maximum saturation. And those those levels are like illegal colors. They don't actually convert back to RGB without causing a negative value or an overflow. So identifying them is is important because it's not likely that you authentically recorded. Hey. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Oh, I didn't like actually screwing, you know. Didn't have a lot of prep time. <laughs> and then by, um, so that's sort of a saturation. If, if, if the video is black and white, for instance, the saturation levels would all be zero all the way across. For each of these plots, you'll see um, five different lines plotted. It's like the minimum, the maximum, the average, and then one called high and low. And those are plotted by excluding the highest and lowest 10%. You know, because often in your video, like, there'll be some random pixels that just don't behave and are, are toggling to like, extreme values. And if you want a general impression on how light or dark or how contrast, uh, how much contrast a frame has, you, you need to exclude the outliers so they don't throw off the, the entire image. The, uh, the tool also has a player. Um, that lets you play back video with a bunch of different uh, filters and uh, multiple at a time. So uh, typically it's open in, in this sort of two filter view. So on the side, it's um, it's just called normal. It's like the presentation of the video. And on the other side, it's the vector scope being enabled in this case. Uh, and this is sort of the, new, the newest layout that we're developing, which is uh, just called the list layout. But for each file that's open, it gives you um, some overall statistics about the file that sort of indicate how drop y it is or uh, to what extent the file has pixels that are out of broadcast range, um, you know, how, uh, how off-center the chroma is, um, like how many frames contain illegal, uh, like illegal color values or out of broadcast color values. So if you digitize a large collection, you can potentially use this to find the worst of your work, you know, to sort of focus on the material that deserves to get redone and, uh, you know, you know, put your attention to places where there's a likely known error, um, rather than kind of skimming through a collection randomly to find problems. Uh, here's a couple of examples that Michael Angoletti sent me this morning, PC tools. Um, you can see here, like all the lines pretty much just go straight across, but then there's a massive spike um, where you, the maximum and minimum chroma values, like, you know, go pretty far out of the center. Um, so when he would look at this frame, you know, this is what he would see. Um, 
So a lot of the actual, like a lot of people in there are like, how do I actually use QC tools initially? Like I suggest like looking, you know, look for public things that are out of place in the graphs, you know, like when the graph is having, you know, a crazy abnormal time, you know, try to figure out why. Um, you know, uh, so he he had like updated I think the firmware in uh, his one of his capture devices or one, one piece of hardware in the digitization chain. He updated the firmware on, and the next day this happened three times in three different videos. And with QC tools, he was able to find all three of them and, and redo the work and address the problem. With um, more traditional QC approaches where you're uh, just kind of randomly looking across the video, this stuff is easy to miss because it's one frame, but if you are letting these like one frame errors happen because of a, a poor set of your hardware consistently over time, like you will be sorry one day. Uh, this is another error he noticed. Um, the bottom plot here is for a temporal outlier, um, which is sort of counting like white speckle or inconsistent pixels over time. So you can see there's sort of this low rumble that happens here um, in the video where it's otherwise, you know, pretty peaceful. Um, in, the, in those places when he looked at the video in those places, you can see like the top third of the video is, uh, you know, very unstable. Um, you know, Michael, you know, Michael Angeletti knows digitization a lot more, so like, you know, well, his expertise much more than mine is like what to do to actually fix the problem, but he was able to digitize the tape without, without this issue on the second pass. Uh, so that's the slideshow part. Now I'm going to cut to the demo part. Um, and then I'd be happy to take questions, and then it's only half hour panel, so I'll try to be quick. All right, so this, uh, there's a focus on making this uh, very accessible and cross-platform. So we developed the GUI in uh, this open source framework called QT, developed and released by, by Nokia. Um, but it's it's good at being um, developed in, but then released in multiple platforms. So if you go to bayback.org/qctools, you can get versions in Linux, Mac, Windows, uh, pretty easily that you can hopefully get onto your computer. Um, so first up, I'm gonna walk through some of the players. All right, so I was uh, setting, setting up a digitization station in Seattle at one point, and they had two beta cam decks. And I was like, I'll do this great trick. I'll put a beta cam deck, a beta cam tape in one deck, digitize it, and put it in the other one, and make sure that they're about the same. Uh, but they were not at all the same. I had, at first, I had a really hard time figuring out what the problem was. I noticed when uh, a scene was very saturated, when something was very saturated, like this guy had a very bright yellow hat, it, it looked kind of, uh, looked kind of like striped eventually, but. In the, in the player, I could see this more apparent. Um, in, when I'm playing normal, there's like a fit, uh, field split button at the top of most of the players. So instead of seeing the image all combed together, you can see field one on top and field two on the bottom. So when, with this kind of player, it becomes much more obvious that field two is sending out no chroma at all. Whereas when it's together, it looks a little less saturated, a little less color, but it's difficult to see on the computer that half the color of the image is missing. Um, I, ha I, I made a sample of this, the, the other scenario, where there's no color on field one, and I noticed when you transcode it to a lower chroma subsampling, like for the web, I transcoded it to uh, 420 in H264, and the result had no color at all because it's only taking color from field one in the subsampling conversion. So it could be this very sort of uh, uh, deceitful uh, problem where it looks enough like there, there's color, and, and somebody might let this pass, but when you try to transcode it, you only get black and white outputs. Um, on, the, on the right, we see the, the vector scope, I mean, the, sorry, the waveform. Um, and all these filters sort of have contextual options. I think last year I showed the, the, when we showed the filter, there were no options. You just kind of saw what you got. Um, but now we can control them a bit more. So I can see uh, the Luma or the two chroma planes separately. Uh, or I can see all three presented on top of each other. Or I can see them separated um, by the fields. So here I'm seeing like all, all three sort of signal components of the image. Field one on the left, field two on the right, YUV uh, going down. So you can see the luma is sort of the same on both sides, but the chroma is very distinct on field two. There's, you know, there's almost no data there. Um, and you can see like in general, like the luma is, is sort of using almost the full range of what the digital sample can contain, but the chroma is, is usually very condensed into the center, like using a very small range, but I found that for diagnosing some problems, um, it's helpful to separate 
split those ranges out and, and stretch them. So this is what the video looks like when you look at the chroma plane. Like this is just the, the Y channel or uh, CR channel. Um, but showing what's happening on the two sides. So I can see that on field two, uh, I'm getting a lot of data that's not, you know, the, the video gets worse and worse. But I can see um, that instead of color, I'm just kind of getting this, uh, you know, pattern over time. Uh, we added the line select filter, because uh, a lot of waveform monitors do that. Um, one of the users, Peter Bookstanger, suggested we put in a, manner to, a means to see what line we're plotting. Um, so if you click the background option, you'll see the, the image in, underneath the, the line select, and when you, uh, sorry, change the, the brightness of the plot. And then, I don't know if you can really see it, but there's like a yellow line moving up and down, and that shows like which line I'm plotting in the waveform. And, the vectorscope, one's hip to vectorscopes. Um, so if I go back to the graphs, like, yeah, I can like, enable the, this is just looking at the saturation graph, so I can see like where the video is very particularly saturated, like this normal purple that shows up, and then, you know, kind of correspond it to the vectorscope and let it play back to see these weird, like, loops and patterns that happen because of, uh, you know, the non-ideal surfaces of the hardware. Like in this case, it's not the, the tape in particular that's causing this problem. Like it plays fine in, in another deck, but the one particular deck is producing, this, you know, this kind of irregular patterns. Uh, I'm gonna open up a, a born digital video and an analog version of the same, just to show you a couple more filters and then I'll take questions. So this video, there's a test pattern at the beginning, and then there's um, just kind of like a blue frame, and then there's a live, live action video from, from then on. But at the beginning, you can see this is a this is born digital animation. In the waveform, it's extremely clean and patterned. Uh, this is 100% color bars with a scrolling uh, gradient. So that's what it looks like on the waveform. On the vector scope, the scrolling gradient covers you know pretty much the, the boundary of um, like YUV color space. So this is sort of Anything beyond this hexagon is, is illegal colors that you can't convert back to uh, RGB properly, but everything inside is sort of norm normally where video will, will have its uh, image. So I wanted to show off uh, the bit plane filter. Um, you know, video is often encoded at a certain bit dip, for instance, 8 bit, 10 bit. Um, with the bit plane filter, you can isolate the individual bit positions and play them back individually. So this is just looking at the first bit. Um, but I can go up to so the second, third, fourth, fifth, six, seven, eight. You know, so this is what the least significant bit of, of the Luma channel looks like. Um, you can see even when I'm viewing this, I see, you know, it's very sort of structured clean because it's uh, born digital. If I uh, flip over to the analog version of this, this is when we, we rolled the tape out to analog and then, um, I mean, to UMAC tape and digitized it back. So you can see the waveform is very different at this point. It's much sort of messier and sloppier. There's a, instead of having like one very particular um, Luma value per column, there's you know a wide range of maybe like 15 values of these kind of fuzzy lines you see. If I go to the bit plane filter, um, you know I can see when I go even to the second bit, there ends up being a lot of differences between the original born digital copy and analog. Like things get fuzzier and noisier very quickly. You know, this is at the fourth bit, and there's already a lot of noise um, because of the analog, car the analog carrier uh, affecting the image. If I go down to like the seventh bit, it's fairly uh, recognizable. So many of the values have changed from the original copy. Uh, and the eighth bit, you know, it's, a, it's about the equivalent value of, of random data at this point. And let's see, one more show up. One, well, this is sort of like a side effect we found in the project, but um, that we could use these filters sometimes to detect um, like provenance. So this is if I'm looking at the the, the chroma planes individually, but uh, instead of having them be very compressed as they are, it's like stretching them uh, far out. When you watch video in this way, you can sort of identify the different um, manners that lossy codecs throw away data for a um, 
for analog capture that you do, this would look very noisy, but for compressed data, this is H.264, you end up seeing uh, these kind of distinct patterns. Um, let me pick a, an MPEG-2 so you can see that. It's like a test file we made at half day. So this is like a shot of some leader, but it's, I don't know, Tommy here? No, right. Yeah, I can talk all about his media now. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be difficult to see from where you are. So this is um, looking at the chroma plane of this encoding. This, this was digitized off of a digital media player as a lossless file, um, but we can see and if I look at the chroma patterns, I can see these sort of patterns of MPEG-2 compression where there's this very like square-shaped macro block uh, pattern in, in the video. Um, so like when, when you look at DB, MPEG-2, HD64, like you know, lossy codecs in this kind of view, you, you see kind of distinct patterns based on you know, the wider uh, rip shape of the DB codec disk block or the square uh, MPEG-2 macro blocks or you know, the more uh, flexible fluid patterns of HD64. Um, yeah, so that's the project. I should go over to take questions, and I really would like to encourage feedback, and I would like to get you guys to, you know, go to the GitHub site, potentially after testing this, you know, report issues, uh, comment on existing ones, or join the discussion somehow. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. instruction for people starting out so that um, we might understand what the tools are and what sort of the normal tolerance might be for some of the um, multi multitude of tools that you've given us? Uh, I, I mean, I, I agree, certainly. Um, yeah, we've made some attempts at, at uh, doing video tutorials, um, but need to make some more serious efforts at this. Uh, they saw what happened before. We do have uh, help documentation in here, so there's you know, six current articles currently that walk through the, the different, um, you know, filters and options to, you know, give a couple hard-coded examples of what normal and abnormal uh, sort of are. Um, you know, but back to my, like, initial advice, like, often <coughs> to open video, look for inconsistencies or incoherencies in the graph, and then, you know, try to play over them to find out why that issue is happening. Um, at, at the bottom of this thumbnail view, we made it so you see nine frames at the same time. So, you know, if you see a place here where it's like, why does the, the color just all like pinch at the center at this point? You can, you know, see the frames at the beginning, all, at the bottom all go to basically black and white at this point. Um, but yeah, documentation, there's some of it in here. Um, these like six HTML pages that, that overview it. Um, and you know we definitely need to produce more. Um, now that the, the the software is kind of settling, like that's definitely our priority over the next couple of months to do more uh, education into how video is built and how to interpret what we are, we're seeing here. That's uh, already now. Yeah, okay, we got it. kicked out. Or? We got to wrap. No, we could, no, you're actually the first speaker in the next presentation at 4:45. I can so, I can cut into all. But lightning time. talks have to get our stuff together, so we need to wrap. All right, thanks for the lead question. All right, thank you. Thank you.